Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is the pathophysiology of disorders of myelin. I will begin by reviewing the function of myelin, and next I will discuss the pathophysiology, clinical features, and morphologic findings in multiple sclerosis, finishing up with a compare and contrast of the different leukodystrophies. So as you'll recall, myelin is an electrical insulator that sheathes axons, enabling rapid propagation of neural impulses. It would stand to reason, therefore, that with myelin loss, we would get slowing and even cessation of our nerve impulses, which can have a tremendous impact on the patient. Now, as you recall, there are really two types uh, of myelin. We have uh, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, the cells that generate myelin are the oligodendrocytes, and each oligodendrocyte can wrap multiple internodes. Internodes are that portion of nerve between two nodes of Ranvier. Uh, while we can get myelination throughout the central nervous system, myelinated axons will predominate in our white matter, which is why it has that whitish appearance. In the peripheral nervous system, it's not oligodendrocytes, but Schwann cells that generate myelin, and each Schwann cell will wrap just one internode. Now, the myelin is very similar between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, but there is uh, a difference in some of the lipids and proteins. And it's been observed that uh, disorders of myelin that affect the central nervous system typically spare the peripheral nervous system and vice versa. Here are just two figures to remind you of how myelin uh, is generated. Here in the central nervous system, you can see our oligodendrocyte, uh, which is wrapping multiple axons. By contrast, here in the peripheral nervous system, we have our Schwann cell, which is wrapping here around this one axon, causing that spiraling uh, form that gives the insulation uh, properties. So there are two types of disorders when we think about myelin. We have our demyelinating disorders, which are acquired conditions that lead to damage to previously healthy myelin. These disorders are often immunorelated, uh, uh, for example, multiple sclerosis, although we can also see uh, demyelination due to viral infection of oligodendrocytes, for example, in progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, as well as uh, with drugs and toxic agents. Now, this is in contrast to our dysmyelinating disorders, uh, which include the leukodystrophies. What we see in these conditions is improper myelin synthesis and turnover, uh, and it's usually due to proteins, uh, due to uh, mutations that disrupt proteins needed for normal myelin function. And unlike our demyelinating uh, disorders, uh, tend to present at a very early age. So we'll cover this in detail when we get to the leukodystrophies. So let's begin uh, with our demyelinating disorder, multiple sclerosis. So this is an autoimmune disease which is characterized by episodes of disease activity, so separated in time, and white matter lesions that can be found throughout the central nervous system, separated in space. It is a common demyelinating disorder affecting about one in a thousand individuals in the U.S. and Europe and may present at any age but is uncommon uh, with a childhood onset or uh, diagnosis after 50 years. As with uh, most autoimmune disorders, there is a female predominance uh, with a two-to-one female-to-male ratio. Now, the pathogenesis, uh, as with all autoimmune disorders, is very complicated and is going to involve uh, genetic uh, times environment interactions. And what uh, it is thought to involve is an autoimmune response to components of the myelin sheath. So let's work through uh, the different factors. So looking first at genetic environmental factors, we know that there's a genetic component because we have increased risk uh, in the first degree relatives of patients who have multiple sclerosis. In fact, their risk is uh, 15 fold uh, greater. Uh, than the general population. We also see a significant risk in monozygotic twins uh, with a risk which is greater than 150 fold. Now there is an association with uh, HLA-DRB1-1501 allele, so uh, there's a three-fold increase in risk with each copy of this allele. Uh, through genome-wide association screening, we've found associations with other uh, genes such as the IL-2 and IL-7 receptors, uh, as well as other components of the immune response. Now, regarding environmental factors, there's an interesting geogra uh, geographic variation seen in multiple sclerosis with increasing incidence with increasing distance from the equator. So multiple sclerosis is relatively uncommon in the tropics, and it's thought perhaps this may be due to a role for vitamin D, uh, which is involved uh, in a number of uh, processes in the body.
Finally, we, uh, we recognize the role of autoimmunity and multiple sclerosis. Uh, what we have is uh, T and B cells uh, that are self-reactive for myelin antigens. And when they uh, are activated, they'll begin secreting cytokines. So for example, our Th1 T cells will secrete interferon gamma, which can activate macrophages. Our Th17 T cells uh, recruit lymphocytes, adding to injury. So in uh, the plaques that we'll be looking at, we can see both CD4 positive uh, and CD8 positive of T cells, as well as uh, there's an impact uh, of B cells and their antibodies uh, to con uh, disease contribution. And we know of this link uh, primarily due to the efficacy of B cell depleting therapies in the treatment of multiple sclerosis. Now there are three uh, clinical types of multiple sclerosis. We have relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, which is the most common form, about 85 to 95% of cases, which is characterized by multiple relapses uh, with interspersed episodes of remission. Despite uh, this remission, uh, patients rarely will return to uh, baseline between uh, the episodes, and there will be the gradual accumulation of neurologic deficits. Uh, the second clinical type is what's referred to as secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, which begins with this relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis over a period of about 10 to 20 years, and then uh, progresses uh, to worsening without remission. And the final type is primary progressive multiple sclerosis, which has progressive disability from the outset with no or minimal uh, episodes uh, of remission. Now, uh, morphologically, uh, we can see a number of features. Uh, grossly, we will see uh, multiple discrete, so sharply edged, uh, gray tan lesions that are slightly depressed. Now, these lesions can also be seen on radiology, and I'll show you that on the next slide. While we can see uh, these lesions uh, throughout the central nervous system, they're most commonly going to be in the uh, ventricles, optic nerve, and chiasm, as well as the brainstem. Microscopically, we will differentiate between our active plaques and our inactive plaques. So active plaques are going to be what you see when that particular area is uh, inflamed. So if a patient presents with unilateral vision changes due to optic neuritis, secondary to multiple sclerosis, if you were to biopsy that lesion, you would see abundant macrophages that are filled with myelin debris. You'd see abundant lymphocytes in perivascular cuffs, often uh, centered on very small veins. Uh, and we'd have preservation of our axons, so they could be uh, slightly reduced in number. With time, once that uh, optic neuritis resolves, uh, and the patient returns to approximately baseline, if you were to, after that, biopsy that lesion, you would see an inactive plaque. There would be minimal inflammation, but we would also see gliosis, astrocytic proliferation, and minimal myelin. So let's look at some pictures. Here is a, a really nice image showing multiple lesions uh, in an MRI of a patient with multiple sclerosis. You can see here uh, we have three different lesions. Now, if a patient has their first presentation with some serological uh, deficit and you do the MRI, you see one lesion, that's not going to enable you to make that diagnosis. You need to uh, have multiple lesions and uh, multiple episodes in time. Here we can see uh, what a gross specimen with multiple sclerosis looks like. You can see this lesion here next to the ventricle. Uh, it has this sharp uh, uh, edge and border with the surrounding uh, relatively healthy white matter. Uh, but this tissue uh, is grayish tan, uh, very shiny, almost glassy, and is depressed if you were to uh, run a finger here. And then here on a uh, myelin stain, of the brainstem, you can see here, this is how healthy myelin will stain, this nice dark blue, and you can see these discrete lesions uh, here scattered uh, in this area. Now histologically, I'm going to show you an example of an active multiple sclerosis plaque. Here we have that biopsy specimen, and the vast majority of cells here are macrophages uh, that are filled with myelin debris. If we do our myelin stain, we're not going to see myelin uh, in the surrounding tissue, but if we do an immunohist immunohistochemical stain for neurofilaments, we can see that the axons are preserved. Uh, so this is that classic uh, finding, loss of myelin, preservation of axons. So the way that a patient will present will depend on which region of the brain is involved. Uh, there are some uh, areas that are classically associated with multiple sclerosis, although, of course, you can get a lesion anywhere throughout the central nervous system. So a classic presentation will be optic neuritis uh, with unilateral uh, vision impairment. 
If we have lesions in the brainstem, uh, presenting uh, symptoms could include cranial nerve signs, such as ataxia, or ocular movement disorders, such as nystagmus. Lesions to the spinal cord can result in motor and sensory impairment, as well as spasticity and loss of bladder control. We can also see some changes uh, in cognitive function. Now, there are some laboratory tests that can help us uh, with making the diagnosis. If we assess the cerebrospinal fluid, we'll see a mild increase in the protein level with an increased proportion of immunoglobulins. This is a marker uh, of continuing inflammation. Uh, and if we were to run uh, the immunoglobulins uh, on a gel and stain them, we would see oligoclonal bands of immunoglobulin. So this is thought to be due to a small number of activated, perhaps self-reactive, uh, B-cell clones that are generating uh, these prominent bands. In addition, uh, we can see moderate uh, pleocytosis in about one-third of patients. Treatment of multiple sclerosis uh, will include your immunosuppressive as well as your immunomodulatory uh, agents. Uh, however, there is not currently a cure uh, for this disease. This brings us next to the leukodystrophies, which have some significant differences from multiple sclerosis. So as I mentioned, this is going to be due to abnormal myelin synthesis or turnover. And in contrast to uh, multiple sclerosis, will present at an early age in most cases. Uh, there will be a progressive loss of cerebral function. And if we do uh, imaging studies, we'll see diffuse and symmetric changes in contrast to the discrete and somewhat random uh, lesions that we see in multiple sclerosis. There are a, a variety of leukodystrophies, uh, so this is a spectrum of disorders, um, many of which are due to single enzyme defects, but there can also be other genetic alterations. The three that I will focus on in this video are Kravid disease, metachromatic leukodystrophy, as well as adrenal leukodystrophy. All of these are, uh, show recessive inheritance, with the first two being autosomal recessive and adrenal leukodystrophy showing X-linked recessive inheritance. So let's begin with Kraba disease. Uh, this is not only uh, a, a leukodystrophy, it is uh, also a lysosomal storage disease. It typically will present at the age of three to six months, and it's due to a deficiency of the enzyme galactosyl ceramidase. Uh, and with this uh, deficiency, we're going to get shunting into a, a pathway that's going to cause an increase in levels of galactosyl sphingosine, uh, which is toxic to both oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. And that toxicity to our oligodendrocytes is going to account uh, for our demyelination. We're actually going to see myelin loss both in our central nervous system as well as in uh, peripheral nerves. Uh, and the initial presentation may be motor signs, such as stiffness or weakness. As you can see here in this gross specimen, uh, there is some gray-yellow discoloration of the white matter. And histologically, uh, Kravid disease is characterized by these uh, very unusual uh, uh, groups of cells. These are multinucleated macrophages that are referred to as globoid cells. They are stuffed with glycolipids. Uh, and in fact, one name for Kravid disease is globoid cell uh, leukodystrophy. Uh, Kravid disease uh, is uh, uniformly fatal. The second disease uh, I'd like to mention is metachromatic leukodystrophy, which again is due to an enzyme deficiency. Uh, this is aryl sulfatase A. With this deficiency, we're going to get the buildup of sulfatides, and here is a histologic uh, specimen showing uh, these sulfatides here uh, in these macrophages. We refer to this as metachromasia uh, because uh, when we stain this with a particular stain, we can get a different appearance. There's a shift in the staining properties, so that's where this name comes from. Uh, grossly, we'll see a thinning of the white matter, and the prognosis will be related uh, to the age of onset. So with uh, early infantile uh, metachromatic leukodystrophy, there's very rapid progression. Uh, with slightly uh, later presentation, uh, the progression is a little bit slower, but again, this is a fatal disease. And finally, this brings us to adrenal leukodystrophy, which is due to mutations in the ATP uh, binding cassette transporter family of proteins, or ABCD1, which is going to lead to impaired transport of molecules into the peroxisome and the buildup of very long chain fatty acids. Presentation will typically be behavioral changes and adrenal insufficiency in young boys with death uh, one to 10 years after diagnosis. Uh, here are some questions so that you can assess uh, your understanding of the material I've just covered. As always, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, please do subscribe. Thank you.